live streaming now. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to Builder Buy. We meet on Wednesdays from 1 to 3. My name's Gil Boyd. I want to thank you for joining us. Looks like we got slim pickings for our law of audience today. Hopefully, there'll be some folks joining us today. Some of the stuff we talked about last week, I want to get back into because we, we didn't really get finished. And the reason I say that is because there's some other stuff that I have more information going on that adds to what we talked about, about whether to um, build a desktop or whether to buy a laptop. I got some new stuff I want to share with you. And some of it confirms some of the other things that I heard. Uh, the topic that we're going to have today that I hope we get to is about uh, resetting the Windows password on a unified EFI BIOS. So I, I hope we're going to get to that. We'll see. But I want to cover this other stuff yes, first yes, as we go through it. Yes, I've got some talking points on Builder Buy, so I'm going to have myself a seat down here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. What you need? Just testing this. Testing the mics. I hope they work. We did an audio check a little bit earlier. So I'm going to uh, go over here and have myself a seat. Ben's going to be helping with the switch. So we'll, we'll see how this all works out. Uh, going over to Builder Buy on the talking points, let me go over to uh, computer number one, I think. Yeah, there we go. You know, last week we talked about SCD key, and I told you the process to go through in the URL. Well, I've got SCD key up here, but I do not have it as a uh, hyperlinked URL. In other words, you'll have to click and cut and paste. The reason I mention this, we met last Wednesday. Right afterwards, you'll get the newsletters from Newegg. Got a newsletter from Newegg, had a discount on some software, 60 or 70% off. The reason I'm telling you this is I was able to buy one of the programs that we've talked about uh, online from uh, Newegg for less, it was less expensive that way than buying it from SCD Key. So wherever you go to buy this stuff, check around. Just because SCD Key seems cheaper on some stuff, that may not always be the fact. You just have to always be shopping around. And I would have shared that with you all today at Newegg, but it was only good for 48 hours. So you, you got to watch that. And a lot of times that kind of stuff is as you're looking at those, you got to look down and it'll be somewhere toward the middle or the bottom. And there'll be something about kind of like, oh, by the way, when these little things, a little icon about software, click on this. And then it goes and shows you all this junk and you got to dig through it. So I wanted to share with that about SCD key and about, uh, about Newegg. Now, we got some stuff about the new NVMe drives coming out, and Jim Fallon couldn't be with us. He sent me a link that came this morning. I don't have it up on Builder Buy, but the new uh, SanDisk, which is the 970, they've come down on the price. So the 970, let's see if I can find that link. Give me a second while I go to this machine. I just realized when he sent that, I have that on a different computer. Let me take a look. I believe that's on computer number three. Give me a second to look for it. Yeah, there it is. Samsung 970 price cuts. He's out of town. So this is on hot hardware. I had also seen something on a couple of other sites. The 970 Evo and the 970 Pro NVMe drives get a steep price cut. Steep by being, let me see if I can pull that in just a little bit. A 512 from 330 to 250, which is pretty good. And the one terabyte from 620 to 500, which is real good. And the other prices, of course, you know, as it, as it falls in line. So I wanted to be sure and share that with you guys. We had some stuff last week we talked about that. And, and again, once you go with an NVMe drive, you don't want to go back. Now, I gave the short answer to Mel because she asked, what's the purpose and what's the uh, benefit of a fast NVMe drive? And the short answer was it, the computer boots faster. That's it. Applications load faster. For example, if I have two computers side by side and I'm doing a clean account activation on both computers. The one that has a spinning hard drive is going to take me probably 45 minutes. 
the one that has the NVMe drive in it is going to take me about 15 minutes. No, I'm not talking about installing an application. I'm talking about when you log on to a computer for the very first time and you're making the decision whether to create an online account or an offline account we talked about, that process can go from 45 minutes to 15 minutes. Because of all that stuff that it's doing and that it's churning, it's churning off that hard drive, that's just one thing. I gave you the short answer, and that was what Dwayne took exception with. I don't understand what you just said about signing on and it taking 45 minutes for the first time I, you... I didn't say signing on. When you create that account... When you create an account the very first time you load... Yes. A program? That's not what I said, Mel. That's why I didn't do this last week. application. Because you're not understanding what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm not. Can, can you repeat that, Jack? Exactly. I'm going to bring up the secondary. Can, can we put a mic there on Jack so, so you can hear that? Go ahead, Jack. I just rephrased what you said. The first time you install Windows, when you have to answer all the questions. And you're creating and the account. And, and create the account and all that stuff. Yep. Went from 45 minutes to 15. Yes. Of course, part of that is probably because you're getting practice and you can answer the questions quicker. True. <laughs> that has a little bit to do with it. Okay. But, when you're, but when you're creating that account the first time, it's not when you're installing Windows because Windows is already there. It's just when you have a brand new computer and you're deciding on that account and answering all those questions, on an NVMe drive, all that's faster, from 45 minutes to 15 minutes. And Jack, because of the kind of machine he's got, has probably seen the same kind of performance improvement. Mel, I would expect you would probably have seen that performance improvement if you had the comparison because you've done that. But if you don't do that sort of thing on a regular basis, looking at a different computer with different configurations, you don't notice it. You take it for granted. But all of those little things matter. So my point is, once you go to a faster drive on a desktop or a laptop, you don't want to go back. So here it is on the control panel, the secondary control panel for Windows settings. And if we went to accounts, and it shows the account and shows I have a local account. When you first are setting up a new computer, Microsoft asks you three times to create a Microsoft account. And if you choose either one, a Microsoft account or a local account, that process is shortened when you're using a faster drive, an NVMe drive. You understand? Okay, so I'm gonna move on from that. I'm gonna close that down. Now, once you get that down, oh, let me back up. Has anybody got any updates from Microsoft today, last night? Yeah, what did you guys get? Did y'all expect the new whiz bang to come down last night? Did anybody get the new whiz bang? No, that did not come down. It was just something that took it from um, a Windows version 16.125 to 16.199. I how just long checked did it, WinVer. How long did it take? It only took about five minutes. Mine took 35 minutes. Machine. Must have been the time of day you were doing it. It was last night. I sat there and watched it. I said, go ahead and do this, because I figured it was going to do the new update. It was not. It was just, in fact, let me take a look over here on this machine. Let's go back to computer number three. I'll bring up the other control panel. We'll go to system, and we'll go to about. When I get through, then I'll go to the updates. Right here, Windows 10 Pro. I'll zoom in on that. And I've got a bleed over on the screen when I zoom in, so let me fix that. See what I was talking about, about the bleed over bend when that happens? I take those graphics on air, off air. Okay, on this computer when I do that, the other computers it doesn't happen. Windows 10 Pro 1709, and there's the OS build, 16299431 that Mel was talking about. Okay, I'm going to zoom out. Close that down, I'll bring up the eye again. This time we'll go to updates, Windows update, view the installed updates. And the installed updates, Adobe Flash and a cumulative update for Windows 10 1709. 35 minutes last night. 
Now, this machine has an NVMe drive in there. That should have occurred a whole lot quicker. Let's get a mic over there on Jack, please. Thanks, Robert. You said yours was uh, version 1803, right? And, but it was bill 16-something? Closer. No, this is bill 1709. I didn't get 1803. That's what I was, thought I was going to get. Oh, okay. Mine's 1803, but it's and it's billed uh, 17134. Interesting. Point one. So you're ahead of the pack. Uh, it, yeah, this started downloading last week. Wow. During this during this during the meeting thing, and it wasn't done. I closed it down, took it home, and it finished. I'm surprised because there's a lot of people that have had their accounts get locked out. I think that's what happened to Mel. She was doing an update, and she got locked out of her account. So I'm surprised you were able to shut yours down and that didn't happen. Uh, I just put Closed the lid, the lid down, which means it hibernates with mine. But Interesting. Well, this was for Bill 1709, and it took 35 minutes. How long did your update take once you got home? Do you remember? Well, it, would, it had not started installing here. It was doing the download. Just the download. Yeah, okay. and it was like 80-some uh, percent, I think, when I left here. Oh, not bad. And I really didn't keep an eye on it at home. I just flipped it open and let her rip. Well, it's interesting. You got it down before anybody else has. I have not forced it. I've been waiting to see what would happen. And now I had three machines. This one, the other two at the house. I've got another one sitting here trying to do it. And I think last week when the computer rebooted while we were having our live stream, I think, oh, Jim, I didn't realize you were here. I should have plugged in your audio. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't know you were sitting there. Came in late. Well, I'll get it next time. Last weekend, uh, one of my uh, desktops, I went and checked to see if I had any updates, and it said 1803 was pending. So I went ahead and downloaded it, and it went smoothly also. Interesting. Can we get a mic over there for uh, David Crook? Yes, David. They have a new feature that's called, I, I forget exactly what it's called, but if you go to look and see if there is an update, if you go to, to, to um, Windows Updates and then you, it doesn't say that there's an update, but if you say, check. if you click on check, then you're considered a searcher, I think, or a seeker, and it will present you with, uh, um, 1803 even if that hadn't been pushed out to your particular computer yet now for the next gotcha does anybody have an Intel SSD for some reason the Intel SSDs are not going to get that update because there's something wrong going on they're not sure if it's a driver issue but it's uh, giving people some grief and causing them to go back into the unified EFI reboot process and they're in this endless loop so if you've got an Intel SSD, you don't want the update right now until they fix it. You know, for every, it's like for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, let me go back over here to the computer. I've got a link up on some wireless cameras, and I've also got something I found kind of curious about CPU utilization. I'm not going to get into it. I'm just going to say read it. Um, get what you uh, will out of it. There's an engineer that, that talks about CPU utilization. And in essence, it's kind of like this, uh, what's going on when the processor, you think, you think something has happened, but you're waiting, but there's really nothing happening. And because of these uh, Spectre updates, it seems to be making that, like the system's freezing, longer. So you can read and see what you get out of that. Um, and I've also got a link up on the update common uh, fixes. Now, something else I want to mention before I, before I forget about this. I always talk about this in terms of a desktop, but we never talk about this in terms of a laptop, and we should. Chipsets rule. And we've got some information that came down the pike I'm going to share with you as soon as I find the link uh, that, that talked about some new processors and some new chipsets. But when it comes to a laptop, we don't ever really talk about the chipsets. And the, and the laptops we've looked at, of all the questions that all the people have asked, and we've got one laptop, this HP Envy 17T, that's had over 17,000 views but nobody has ever asked about the chipset. I find that kind of interesting and curious. 
So with that said, because we talked about the six core processor last week that Intel has, and then we're only talking about the i7, we didn't talk about the i9. I can go over to B&H and I can show you an i9 six core and that's a pricey laptop. And the way they build out those laptops, that's a beefy laptop. But that doesn't mean that's a laptop you want to buy unless you need a workstation class type of laptop. We're talking about a $3,500 to $4,000 laptop. So I think the six core in an i7 is bang for the buck, especially if you start looking with the kind of money they're putting in on the i9 on a laptop six core. I just, I can't see it. If I were going to put that kind of money in, I want that on a desktop. So I've got some chipsets listed here, and you can go through the process. Intel, Intel Mobile, the two top chipsets, the HM370, the QM370. And because I found it curious, if you try to look up the 8750, which is a six-core processor, and you're trying to figure out what chipset it uses, it uses the 300 series chipset. And that I was not able to get directly from Intel. I got that from Wikichip. I have a link up on that. Moving on. I've also got a link up on some professional streaming devices because last week our streaming solution, which depends on a Windows computer, it, it went poof on us. Microsoft updated the computer without my knowledge until after it was done, and I didn't say yes. And it was not supposed to be one of those during business hours, which was like, you know, during the day when we meet. Anyway, we lost our stream, so we did a second stream for the second part, and I titled it according to what it was, that Windows uh, reset our, our stream, so uh, we lost our stream. The point of it is the only way to maintain that stream is to remove Windows from the uh, equation, and that's with a professional solution. So I've got a link up that has the two top professional solutions, and they do a comparison and that is on number 27. Five things, that's what this guy does. They'll do five things on lots of different topics. Live streaming with the LiveView Solo versus a Teradek VidU Pro. I found it kind of cr uh, creative. Now, moving on toward today's topic, and this got me to thinking when we were working on Richard's Asus, let's see, that's called an Asus T100T. That, uh, that device, there's not, uh, first of all, a computer has two modes for the BIOS. Legacy mode, and I'm going to show you some stuff on this Lenovo that I'm going to try to work with this that I haven't had a chance to do this in advance. So I'm going to be doing it raw out of the box. But most computers have the legacy BIOS and the unified BIOS. With that device that uh, Richard had, you only had the unified EFI BIOS. You couldn't go in and say, change this over to legacy mode. If we could, then the NT password editor would have worked, which is a Linux boot. Now, there's supposed to be a way to create a unified EFI disk that will uh, allow you, in fact, I've got a link up here on LifeWire, how to create a unified EFI bootable Ubuntu USB drive in Windows. Well, I've, I've tried some of these tools, and I even tried, uh, uh, what was that program called I told you guys about? It was uh, Rufus that lets you do some pretty wild stuff, and I, I wasn't able to get Rufus to work for me to create a disk that way. So I told you about PC Unlocker. I can't show you PC Unlocker from here because the IP address is in Singapore. It's a two-part process. One is the application, and two is the program that writes the application to the disk the way it needs to be seen because we need a USB stick. You know, we're getting away from having access to a bootable CD. And with Richard's machine, with the disk that Robert had, I never could get his BIOS to recognize the CD. It wouldn't see the drive, it wouldn't see what was on the drive. But it would see a memory stick. So once I had the memory stick in, I didn't find all this other information until six hours after I had got him, got him going again. So I found this second tool, which is uh, IC Password, and they have two versions of the tool. I can take you to their site. Now, ironically, I bought this program. It's one program that does everything. It will go ahead and install itself, and it will write to the disk to give us access that we can then boot on a machine instead of a two-program process. Price-wise, it's about the same. Uh, what's interesting is their payment gateway showed me that I'm buying this from somebody in China and the payment gateway is through somebody in Germany. 
kind of interesting. So I'm going to go to uh, IC password. I'll hold down the control key and bring this up. Now the key feature that is just now coming on board is support for unified EFI computer from a USB drive or a CD DV. I'm going to zoom in on that so you can see a little bit better. And this has probably come about within the last, as I would say, couple of months. Uh, I had not looked for it. I had not had a problem with it. But once I saw it on Richard's machine, I could see that's going to be a bigger problem for us in the future. Now, um, can this be done with a free tool? It should be, but I'm not having luck with it yet. I need to spend more time with it. Yes, Mel? Yes, when I click on that link to IC password, yes. I'm getting a, a warning from WOT that it may be an insecure, a mal potentially malicious site. Any idea why? <laughs> the best ones are. As Jack said, the best ones are. Uh, I don't use that program, so I'm not having a problem with it. I did go ahead and buy the program, uh, and I have downloaded it and paid for it, so I've got it. And I've got a key for it that's a mile long. So what I'm going to do is walk you through the process. But I don't use that program. I use Kaspersky. The only thing I know up here is I cannot get, if I go back to Builder Buy, I cannot get to uh, PC Unlocker. If I hold down the Control key and press that, website blocked. Because up here at Chapelwood, they're using a Dell SonicWall network security appliance. Now. I've talked about this before. This is in Singapore, this particular IP address. They will unblock for us for stuff that we need to see. I said, nope, keep it the way it is for everybody else for default. If we can't get to it, we'll work around it. So we can't see PC Unlocker here at the meeting, but you'll be able to see it at home. But the one I can see is IC password. And the problem you had, Mel, I'm not having. So you have to decide if that's something you want to look at. I'm looking at it, and it's, it's not a problem. With the IC password? Let me try it again. ICPassword.com. I've got it up on this computer. Now, let's, uh, let's remember here. You guys are on the uh, Comcast. And I am on the fiber with AT&T. So even though we are both on a sonic wall device, the sonic wall device for the wireless that you guys are on may be set to be more restrictive than what I'm on. I would think they would both be set the same. So again, here, if this is something you guys can't see from here, you can see at home. Did you say yours initiated through Germany also? Or was that the other one? Uh, this one, their payment gateway was through Germany. Okay, this, this one says connection initiated towards Italy. Towards Italy? Yeah. Well, I can show you. <laughs> let me flip over here. I'll show you the invoice. Let me bring it up right here. Here's the invoice. Seller of the product, Digital River, GmbH, which is in Germany. Uh, Lisa Zia? It's not showing. Do what? It, screen. Oh, Ben, you want to flip me over to number two, computer number two? Greg is not here with us, and there we are. our, our uh, current operator. switch operator is Ben. And I'm He's thankful trying. Ben's able to do this. Okay, let me scroll in just a little bit. I did this this morning. I wasn't able to do this last night because I was, I was too wiped out. Anyway, the publisher, Lisa Zia, and she's in uh, Shenzhen, China. And the payment gateway was through Germany. And they even charged tax. They called it a VAT, the U.S. So I paid uh, $3.79. So it was $49.74. So 50 bucks for this little program. And um, seller collected uh, use tax applies because of sales tax from outside jurisdiction. So I think it's interesting this stuff is coming from overseas. Why isn't somebody here in the U.S. doing this stuff? You know, I told you about the issues I had with uh, CD Key. Their payment gateway, of which they had four or five, used their PayPal payment gateway. With this one, I just used a regular credit card, and I just I found it curious. This is what I got. 
Same thing for an invoice. Anyway, let me go back over because I want to uh, I want to look at their website. And the key to this program, you'll just have to see it from here since you can't look at it on your computer, but you can see when you get home. Support for unified EFI-based computer. Now, if we were to look at the one from uh, PC Unlocker, it talks about, because there's two aspects of the unified EFI BIOS. One, unified EFI, which is what we need. The other part is secure boot. Most computers that have unified EFI also may have secure boot turned on. Uh, the other program said it would work with secure boot. This one just says with unified EFI BIOS. Now, I don't have a laptop with a, a uh, password on it, but I thought we might could show it from this Lenovo because this Lenovo, you know, it's, it's kind of quirky. Every computer is a little bit different. For example, when we did this originally, the Lenovo Flex, it had a dead battery. So we had had another computer up here and somebody turned off the power strip. So when I'm sitting there trying to power it up, it wouldn't come up because the power strip was off. When I realized, I turned the power strip on and up we came. As opposed to the HP Envy 17T, it had a charged battery when I pulled it out of the box. It was ready to go. I, pl I plugged it in, but it was ready. So what I'm going to show you is what's important is how you get into your BIOS. I've downloaded the documentation and what you're looking at with this device there's two modes in the BIOS, Unified EFI and Legacy Support. Now to get into this device, there's not a keyboard sequence to do this. I have to use the magic key, which is like we get into a CD drive. When you've got to make it open, you use a paper clip. So what I've got to do is shut this computer down and get in with a paper clip, and there's a button right beside the on off switch that I touch with this thing turned off that will bring up one of three menus and then will let me if I needed to either change the legacy support or go to unit EFI or it will let me bring up the boot menu and all I need is the boot menu but the first thing I want to do does anybody have anything that I can cut a piece of cardboard with because I want to create the disk you got one Thanks, Ed. Oh, you got one, Robert? I don't keep anything sharper than a crayon. I, do. I don't. I might hurt myself. In the meantime, I reset my VPN for Amsterdam, and it went through just fine. You used a VPN? Yeah. And it worked? Yeah. Amazing thing about VPNs. I'll let you close it. Okay. Thank you. I think this is going to become more of an issue as time goes on. And after what I, like I said, went through with Robert. So I've got a brand new memory stick. And this again follows the same specs that we work with the Microsoft, which is a 32 gig or smaller. I expect this is going to set this up as a FAT32 disk. That's my expectation. Because what I want to know is, does it work? What this should do is enumerate those SAM files and show us what's there. And then let us reset the password if we need to or choose to. And the point of all this is, if we didn't make it clear last time, if we can reset the password, then why put a password on there? Just that simple. If we can reset it, then why bother? Do what? Richard, do you have an answer to that? I was asking Richard. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was always my thing is why is there a password on there? Can we, can we get a mic over there on Robert, please? Behind you. I would say it's because more than 99% of uh, PC users can't, and so that it actually does work. Uh, the, very few, you know, 10,000 people in the world who know enough to do that. Uh, they're busy doing something. Maybe they're stealing people's stuff or maybe they're not. But, you know, something that uh, most people can't do is pretty secure. Well, I've downloaded the program and there's actually two versions. I'm going to zoom in on this screen because I want to show you. Let's go over to computer number two, Ben. 
computer number two. Oh, sorry, you were busy. There's only so many of us here. There you go, okay. If you go to their site, you download the trial, that's the file you get. When I downloaded the uh, trial and then downloaded the other program that was in the link with the invoice, it looks like the file name is different, trial V, but the file size is the same. Let me zoom out on that. I had this on another machine. Yeah, there it is. Let me zoom back in. The file size is the same on both these files, but I'm going to use the second one, and I'm going to install it on this disk. So let's see what we get. Of course, a little dialog box is going to pop up and say, are you sure you want to install this? Okay. Select destination where I should install this. This will go to the only place that we can go, which is on the C drive. And it's going to program files, which tells me it must be a 64-bit application. Interesting. So we're going to go yes. We're going to create a program shortcut for the folder. We're going to go yes. Create a desktop link and a shortcut link on the quick launch. So we'll say yes. Blah, blah, blah. Ready to install. We're going to install the program. So it's going to go to C program files, IC password. Start menu the same. Additional tasks with the two shortcuts. So let's install. Should be fairly quick. And if you notice, that says Win PE ISO. Launch. Okay, we're going to launch it. It wants the license email. Let me uh, zoom out just a minute. Take that off screen for just a minute, would you, Ben? Flip it to uh, flip it to something else. That'll work. Look at, look at that for just a minute. Let's see here. I've got to pull up the key and the email address. Excuse me while I put this in. My email address. Okay, I'm taking care of the registration and I'm putting in this mile long password. So bear with me just a minute. Okay, the trial version can only find account but not reset. Go to another accessible PC to purchase the full version. To purchase the full version. So the trial version can only find the account, not reset. This is the full version. So I'm going to register it. Okay, you can go back to that computer now. Shows registration successful. You leaving us, Nick? Hopefully we'll see you next week. And I pray that Joe will be with you. Take care. Okay, now we're on the Windows Password Recovery Advanced. Okay. Welcome to Windows. Welcome to IC Password Windows Password Recovery Advanced. Remember, there's two versions. We're doing the advanced version. The reason for the advanced, because we want to reset that password. So this little laptop only has like, uh, let's see, one USB port which is kind of squirrely, excuse me, two USB ports. I got a mouse plugged into one. And the other one is the, uh, I've got the little anchor device that Jack likes where I'm plugging my network. So I'm gonna plug into this device and put this memory stick on here. And let's see if this will recognize. Drive selected and it automatically shows create a password reset disk USB flash drive. Select a target drive, it's got it, it's drive letter E. Click the burn USB button to burn a bootable password disk. Now, again, if we'd have gone to the other site, we would have bought the program that was around the same price, but then we had to download a separate program on their site, one that was for the CD and another one that was for the USB. This one from IC Password, we bought the program and everything is inclusive, which is kind of cool. 
So I'm going to burn the USB. Now then, USB flash drive will be formatted and all your data in the drive will be lost. Do you want to go on now? Let's do it. Well, where'd my screen go? There it is. Okay. So it's doing its thing. And when it's finished, I'm going to go take a look at the disk and see what we got. Burns successfully. Okay. I'm going to uh, minimize all that. Shows the program. I'm going to bring up Explore. Let's look at that drive. And uh, that's pretty cool. Unified EFI. So it's, it's ready to go. So what I want to do now, I'll close the application. Let me close all the uh, applications down. And I'm going to need to reboot. So we're going to have to take this down to a... Uh, let me see if I can take the camera here and put it on this because otherwise you guys won't be able to see this. I'll put a camera here on my shoulder. Because I do not expect to be able to see this from the HDMI. Because that only works in Windows. And if that camera is not in a good location, then I will turn it just a little bit make it a little bit easier to see. Okay, now what I've got to do is shut it down. And when I shut it down, then I'll use my magic paper clip and go in and touch that button like the instruction said. Let's see how this works. So we'll power off. Okay, power went out on the light. The light's pulsing. So I'll press this little button. That didn't work. I need to power it down completely. So let's shut it down this time. Oh, shoot. Microsoft wants to update it. Boy, I tell you, that is just, uh, ain't that just wonderful? We can't, we can't do what we're trying to do because Microsoft wants to update the computer. Okay, then what I'm going to have to do is uh, I'll have to show you how that's going to work then next week. I can't finish it because that's a, it took 30 minutes for the other computer. I don't expect this to be five minutes. Geez, that stinks. That, that is annoying. Will that program allow you to make multiple copies of it, the stick? I don't see why not. <laughs> Didn't say I couldn't. What do they cost? Has anybody got a memory stick? Might be worth trying. Let me, uh, let me bring the program back you up. defray your cost. Let's see, that was called IC. wonder how they have it set up here on the menu. I mean, if it doesn't, uh, you could potentially be hurt if you only get one shot. Uh, that's a good point. That's a good point. Let's see, IC password. This looks like the program. There's the program. Okay, if I pull that out, just for grins, that's one disk I created. I happen to have another one. You got a stick, Jack? One that you're not using? One that we can reformat? You don't mind? He won't mind. Okay, is this USB 2 or 3? Oh, it's 2. Okay, let's do this. You don't mind me reformatting? No. Okay, here we go. Let's see what we get. Shows the disk. Create a password reset disk. Drive letter E. Burn it. Okay, it'll be formatted. We're going to do our thing. Because now what I'd like to do is I'd like for you to test it and try it and see if it works for you. Because I'm curious if this will do what it says it'll do. Yep. So 
So we're burning the disc. Burn successful. Gil? Yes, sir. What is this for? Is this just Windows 10 or is this booting any computer? This will be for any computer to get access to uh, reset your passwords. So it should work on Windows 7. In fact, that's a good question. Let me go back to uh, close that. Can we get a mic over there on? Uh, right at the bottom of the page, it says uh, Windows password key standard runs on any Windows 10, 8, 7, Vista, or XP. Yep, there it is. Supports 10, 8, 1, 8, 7, Vista, XP, 2000. Wow, goes all the way back. Well, I tell you, there were some times when it was 2000, this would have really come in handy. So, amounts of burning, unrestricted. So I can make as many of those discs as I want. And I'm going to take a look at this disc, bring up the window. It left the file name the same. Oh, it left an MP3 file on there. That's interesting but it did everything else it needed to. That's curious. So I'm gonna pull that disc out. So the other part that I want to show of actually using it, we're gonna to have to do it next week because of Microsoft's antics trying to update. What I should have done when I plugged this in, I should have set this for a metered connection, but I didn't know that was gonna do that. Oh, thank you, Robert, appreciate it. Anyway, you saw how easy it was. There should be a free program for doing this. Well, there is now. <laughs> so you can give that a shot. So I'm going to go back over to the talking points, and since that's as far as I can go, that was the topic of that today. We'll finish that next week and do the whole part. Uh, what I want to get into, and I think it's going to take some more time, is talking some about, about what we didn't finish last week. Now, laptops. I've always judged a laptop by the ASUS Zen 4K laptop. Lou's got one, uh, Nick Streeter's got one, Andrew, glad you're here, Andrew. Andrew's got one, that's, that's my favorite laptop. 1225 and then 1250, that was two years ago. Okay, ASUS is revamping that line of the ASUS Zen laptops. Supposed to be coming out in the next month or two. That's as much information as I've got. And I've even got a link up, I believe, to uh, some stuff about uh, what HP is doing. Initially, the HP site would come up, you'd see a graphic, and it would blink and go away. And I figured out how to make the graphics stay up, but there's still those two sites, the ASUS Zen and with a model number and also the HP site. There's nothing on there about buying them. It's just this is what's going on, these are the specs. So if we were to go over to like B&H, and we could do a look on this particular processor, we're gonna see more models are available now than what were available last week. But still, the good stuff that we're looking for, we're still waiting on. Now, I've got a really, really interesting article here I gotta share with you guys on a side note before I go any further. Our projector we use is 1080. We've been talking about 4K projectors for a long time. I'm gonna come back to desktops in a minute. This link we've got on uh, is to ViewSonic. ViewSonic now has a 4K 3500 lumen projector, and the price is not bad, $1,500. Beforehand, we were looking at a whole lot more money from either Sony or uh, Christie Digital or someone like that. Now, ViewSonic has two. They've got one that's 2,200 lumens, and they've got this, and it's 3,500 lumens. 3,500 lumens for that kind of price blows my mind. So if anybody's interested in a 4K projector, mm -hmm. that's what's available now. I would expect others will follow shortly. But we've been talking 4K for several years, and it's just now starting to come out. Now, in terms of what we do for the meeting, I'm still a fan of a video wall. And we've seen the real thin monitors that are almost like a piece of paper you hang up on a wall. But those are not affordable yet. So I wanted to share that with you. 
I've got a link up here on Ars Technica on a laptop if you want to see what HP is doing with a, uh, that's not a bang for the buck laptop, but that's a big bang laptop. Five pounds, a four terabyte SSD and 32 gigs of memory. And also notebook checkup, excuse me, notebookcheck.net, refreshed HP Pavilion. They're going to call it the HP Pavilion Gaming Series. Now, for those of us looking for a business computer, the difference in a business computer that we talk about all the time and these gaming laptops, they've got better video in them. Now, as, I, as I told you last week, if you, if, you need, if you need video like I use for doing the graphics, that's one thing. But if you don't, then it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Microsoft starts monkeying with a computer. I have to look and see what's going on. Uh, so I wanted to share that with you. Uh, now this HP store, talking point number 10, I'm going to hold down the uh, control key and let's see if we can get that up. Okay, see what happens when I clicked on the link? The graphic that was there goes away. Under features up here on the upper left and under buy, under buy there's nothing that appears. It's, it's empty. But if I click on features, that graphic comes back up. And now I can view options. It took me probably seven minutes to figure that out because I couldn't, I couldn't understand why it kept going away. But it, you can take a look and see what they're doing, an Enforced GTX 1060 or an AMD Radeon RX 560. The page still draws a little odd. Apparently they're expecting a different browser. But you can get an idea of the specs and what's in that computer, what's coming down the pike. So that link is up. And I've got the link uh, up to uh, ASUS. On the ASUS Zen, we have a model number. And this is going to be an ASUS Zen Pro 15, which brings up an interesting point. 15 inch, 17 inch. If you're talking a 17 inch screen, you're going to be pushing six to seven pounds. If you're talking a 15 inch screen, then you can keep it under five pounds. And the 15 inch screens are running about four and a quarter, four and a half pounds. So there's options and there's considerations. I can show you two 17 inch and I can show you two 15 inch with the same processor on B and H. And you can say, you know, which one's better for you? It, it depends on which direction you want to go. If you need lightweight, you can get some pretty heavy duty specs, but you're going to pay a little bit more for less weight. If you can handle a bigger screen, I can show you a 17 inch ASUS that's, uh, again, one of the Republic of Gamers, around $1,500. Whereas you look at that MSI we talked about last week, which is the MSI GS65, $2,100. 15 inch screen, but it's about four and a quarter pounds, excuse me, less than four and a quarter pounds. Or a 17 inch screen and you're pushing almost seven pounds. It's going to cost you more to have something smaller. So if we go to, uh, and I've also got a link up on B&H under Thunderbolt 3. Some of these new laptops, they have USB-C, but the USB-C port may or may not be Thunderbolt 3. That you've got to look at and decide and say, this is what I want or this is what I don't want. But I've got a link up to Thunderbolt 3 stuff for B&H. I stumbled across it and I thought that's kind of nice to have. Might you know, come in handy. Yes, Robert. Uh, do any of the 15-inch computers have a keypad on the side? Now, that's an interesting question. Hmm. Well, to me, that's the issue. It's not the screen size. I just don't want a computer that doesn't have the keypad. So if that restricts me to 17 inches, well, then so be it, and you don't look back. That's kind of where you're at. Yeah. If you want a keypad on the side, for example, and I can compare these two computers right here, the HP Envy 17T, that's 17-inch uh, can we get it? Let's let me let me flip this camera around here where you can see a little bit better these two laptops. The HP 17T, the HP Envy 17T on the right, this has the touchpad. For I mean, this has the uh, keypad for the uh, the numerical keypad. Yes, you've got your touchpad. So you've got your your keyboard, and then you've got your numerical keypad on the right side. The keys on this are a little tough for me on a 17 inch. Whereas if I look at this on the left on this Lenovo Flex, it's a 15 inch, but it doesn't have the keypad on the side. But the keys on the keyboard are easier for my fingers mm -hmm. to, to manipulate, to mess with. Uh, 
We've looked at laptops at Builder Buy since laptops were available, but we're spending more time on it because, as I said, we've got a video that's got over 17,000 people that have looked at that laptop. There's nothing we've ever done with desktops, with desktops that it's ever had that kind of uh, people looking at it. So Builder Buy is what we're about, and building desktops is what we do, but we're going to be looking a lot at laptops. Mel? Yeah. Um, the other thing on keyboards, in case somebody hasn't noticed it before, I like to use keystrokes to go to the top of the page and the bottom of the page and things like that. And uh, on many of these keyboards, they're set up so that the movement keys for page up, page down, home, and end are also on the arrow keys. And to make them work, you've got to hold down. To get an arrow key, you just do the arrow. But to make the page up and down and home and end work, you've got to hold the control and the function key well, you bring, you bring up an interesting point. And that's always a pain, unless you want to use an external keyboard. There's stuff I do on a desktop where I have keyboard shortcuts that are easy to find because I know those keys. But when I'm going to a laptop, I'm verbalizing what I'm saying because I can't find the key. And some of those keys just flat are not there. So when I use a keyboard shortcut to get to something, I'm trying to figure out now how do I get to that without that keyboard shortcut? I'm, I'm having to relearn some things. And, and even the way the keyboards on this HP work as opposed to the Lenovo. Uh, for example, if I want to use the function keys, I press the function key, FN key, and then the function key for it to work. I don't have to hold it down, I just press it. Whereas on the Lenovo, I have to hold down the FN key and press it. So it's, it'd be nice if everybody standardized like a regular keyboard, but they don't. Uh, but one thing I do, because I'm not real nimble with a touchpad, I plug an external mice into whatever I'm working on. And that was something I found with that device that uh, Robert had. After I spent two hours trying to figure out how to get into the BIOS, and two hours how to figure out how to get that thing to boot off of a <laughs> USB drive, and then two hours figuring about, well, after that six hours, in, in a long story short, what I found was, to work with that little thing he had that I couldn't hardly see, I plugged in this device from Anchor that Jack has talked to us about. No driver required, it automatically works, it plugs into a USB port, it gives me three USB ports on top and it gives me one network port. To work on that device of Robert's, I was able to plug a mouse into that, I was able to plug a keyboard into that. And the keyboard shortcut to get into his BIOS off that external keyboard was a piece of cake. But trying to manipulate the keys because he's got one key on the back to turn it on and he's got two other keys and you have to hit the right sequence. And you have to hit those keys and it's not the first time you hit them but the second time you do it that it lets you into the BIOS. Whereas with the external <coughs> keyboard, it worked the first time every time. It took me six hours to figure all that out. And I was, I was just, I was nuts, I was crazy. But anyway, I agree with you, and I, and I can relate. Yes, sir, Al. Yeah, I was looking for laptops, and I came across an HP 15Z notebook that does have a, a keyboard. I mean, a, a 15 a, inch. 15 inch, and I got the model number here. I really liked it. But let's uh, take a look at it. What's what is it? It's an HP what? It's a 1JD 33. Wait a minute, 1JD 33 UT pound ABA. Pound ADA. A B, a B is in boy. A B A. Yeah. Yes. Keep it. Did you find that? I, I oh. found it at H uh, B and H. You found it where? B and H. The, the, your bottom of the screen there. Oh B and H. Good, 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 good place to buy from. So you're looking at a workstation. Interesting. An HP 15.6 inch ZBook G4 mobile workstation. So you've got a four core processor, 16 gigs of memory, a 512 gig NVMe M.2, and your resolution is 1080. That looks like a lot of laptop for the money. Let's look at the keyboard if it'll show it to us. There is a keypad there, and that's a 15 inch. Hmm. 
I, I, I would want to see it. It's got, uh, it's got the space bar, and then it's got three keys above and three keys below the touchpad. So I guess they're using that as left, right, and I'm not sure how they're using the center ones. Ports. Wow. This has got a uh, Kensington lock, the network. It's got a VGA, a USB port, and that's probably a memory slot for an SD card. Let's see what the other side looks like. The other side has, uh, okay, if you notice the lightning marks, so first we have power, then two lightning marks, which means those are Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt what? Three. Um, it says three? Yep. Wow. HDMI, and then two USB ports, and then your headphone jack. Yeah, that's got a lot. And this says SC. Is, is that a memory card slot? Yeah, that's what I thought too. Now this says, uh, wow, that's got a Quadro M1200 in there. Let's look at the specs. Okay, it's got 16 gigs of memory. It'll support 64, which is good they're showing that because uh, we don't have to go check out. You know, this thing is always what the processor will support and the way the vendor is implemented, it could be two different things. So you've got 16 gigs, perfect place to be, nothing to change. You're using DDR4, you can upgrade if you want to. And it's got, wow, three slots. Most laptops have two slots. So it's got one 16 gig stick and the other three slots are open. 260 pins, so dim. Interesting. Well, there's a total of four slots, but one slot's occupied. So you've got three oh. slots that are empty. I've, I've never seen a laptop with four slots. Have you? Jack? Yeah, me neither. That's, uh, that's interesting. Are they suggesting you should overclock? Uh, I don't know about overclocking. They didn't suggest that, but I'm also surprised this has an NVIDIA Quadro. Uh, this is curious. As a side note, NVIDIA has come out with a new workstation class card. I was really excited about until I saw the price of it. <laughs> and it's one of those cards that if you got to ask how much, you can't afford it. When I found out how much it was, I thought, geez. 15-inch screen, aspect ratio, and it's a 1080. It's not a touch screen. The brightness is 300. So if somebody want to know how many nits it is. External resolution. Available slots, a two and a half inch, and an M.2. So, the full on the well, apparently they're going to get out of their uh, HDMI better than 4K, yeah. 5120 by 2880. Hmm. Better all the time, isn't it? Sure is. Is that the Thunderbolt? That's how it could, be. I don't know. could be the Thunderbolt spec. No optical drive. Here you are, two Thunderbolt three. Three USB 3.1 ports, Type A. Now HDMI 1.4. To get 4K, HDMI should be 2.0. So that's how they're getting that high resolution is out of that Thunderbolt 3 port. It's got speakers, a microphone, a microphone combo jack, the SD card slot, wired gigabit, 802.11ac wireless, Bluetooth 4.2. Got a camera, 90 watt hours. So you should be able to get nine hours off that battery. That says maximum runtime 17 hours. Uh, maybe. It's also got Windows 10 Pro in there. Package weight, <laughs> wow, 8.85 pounds. That's heavy. Wow. Well, uh, you know, you're right. That says package weight. It doesn't say actual laptop weight. My guess is that's probably a seven-pound laptop because that says. Wow. 
Oh, right there it is, 5.7. I didn't see that. So 5.7 pounds. That's, that's a lot in there for 6 pounds. This HB Envy is, I think, 6.1 pounds. That's a lot in there. Now, as far as the processor, this is one I wouldn't have looked at because it, this processor was uh, last year's processor. It's four cores, nothing wrong with it. The new processor coming out is a six core. Look so, at those clock speeds, 2.8, 3.8. That's what I was talking about. Yes. It looks like they're suggesting to overclock. Well, you, you could. You know, if it kicks into overdrive for processing it, you, you could go that high. But what I want to know, I like to go look at the specs on the processor. They, they've been pretty clear on what this will do. And they're implementing it. Okay, Q1 of uh, 2017. It's just an older processor. Four cores, eight threads. Six meg cache. And it's dual channel. It'll support 64 gigs, so it's running in single channel right now. It'll sh and it shows here, this is interesting. This is what I wanted to know. They're getting out of the HDMI 1.4. No, no, no. Out of the HDMI 1.4, they're getting 4K30. Now, it'll do 4K60, but it's going to have to go. That says uh, external, so that'll have to be out of the uh, Thunderbolt port. Could you take another look at the processor on that? Over the here? I, I7 or whatever it said. It's an I7 7700HQ. Okay, that's what mine is. And it's showing eight cores on the desktop. How come? Uh, four cores, eight threads. You're, ah, okay. You're, you're each, using, each thread gets processed as a core. Yeah, you're using... Okay, uh, I got you. What's that program? Uh, that's confusing to me, too. Uh, I'm using the CPU monitor. Yeah. Uh, yes. The CPU monitor that is with the... Uh, gadgets. Yes, with the yeah. gadgets, yeah. yeah. For example, this is a Ryzen computer. It says 16 cores. Well, it's actually uh, 8 cores, 16 threads. I, I don't know why they do that. but So this is 4 cores, 8 threads. Quad core, 4 core. And the new one is, of course, 6 core. That's a lot of laptop for the money for $1,500. Now, I can show you a 17-inch that's about $1,500. It has a 6-core in it. It's an ASUS. So you say, well, you know, which direction do you go? That's a decision you have to make. These two laptops, I didn't know about the 6-core when I did the HP. That was an $800 laptop. To buy it now at Costco, it's $1,050. To buy that in the correct configuration is $1,220, but buying it direct because there's no NVMe drive. Good machine. Manolo considered it slow, so I pointed Manolo in the direction of a Dell. Did that mention a camera? Uh, they've all got a camera. I think it's a 720. Okay. I read some people talk about some of the computers having a lame camera. They've all got a 720 camera, so I don't, I don't see how you can define that as lame. Uh, looks from the bezel like it would be in the top border too, which is better than the bottom one. I've seen some so in the bottom, people which aren't strikes looking up me your as nose. odd. <laughs> Don't you think that's odd? Yeah, 720. Let's uh, see if we can take a look at the picture on it again. Yeah, there it is at the top. It's as close as I can get. Let me see if I can go a little bit better. So there's your camera. And that's probably your microphone on the sides. I don't know what that is right by it. Now in the same model or area, 16 gigs, all they do is change. There's a Quadro M620. an i5, so they've got two i7s, a one terabyte versus a 512 with a 620. I think the one you're looking at, you know, that's a, that's a lot of laptop for the money. So you have to decide, do you want to get a, a four core for $1,500? Do you want to get a six core for $1,500? Mm -hmm. 
This is a 15 inch screen, HP, and I think an HP is a good box. Or an ASUS, which is the ASUS Republic of Gamers. It's considered a gaming machine. This is a business laptop, mobile workstation. It's got a lot of connectors on it, Robert's right. It's got Thunderbolt 3. Probably the next laptop I will get, if I can't get it from Costco, will probably come from B&H. I like, I like doing business with them. We've had, we've had good luck with cameras and video stuff that we use up here to do the meeting with. Lights and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, let's see, that processor, we had... I'm going to pull that number off because I cannot remember it. Thanks, Ed. Hope we'll see you next week. Okay, what I want to do is go to, uh, again, B&H. Well, I was going to show you guys that program, but not with the computer's going to reboot on us. Okay, I punch in this processor. I get relevance. I'm going to do best sellers. The Gigabyte Arrow, $2,300. Here's an ASUS. I wouldn't do that ASUS. Let me, uh, let me zoom in on this a little bit. The easy way to do this is go to the B&H notebooks and then drill down. So what I'm going to do is uh, go down to the processor. And this will let me pick. I can go by i7 or i9. They have six i9s. We're going to look at the uh, 52 i7s. This will get us in pretty close. Then we can start picking our processor speed. They've got five that go up. And right here, there are 49 that are a 6-core. I'm just saying, here's the technology. 16 gigs of memory. Twenty-three with Windows Pro. Fourteen with just Windows 10. No burners. Some have Bluetooth 4.1, 4.2, and some have Bluetooth 5. We don't get a choice on, oh, yeah, we do. A 1080, a 1070, a 1060, and a 1050 Ti. Okay. A minimum spec on a new machine, if you're buying a consumer-type card, would be a 1050 Ti. The reason I say that is a spec that Netflix set forth. And now that this has come up, we have a link on Builder Buy to Red Shark News where it looks like Netflix is now the broadcast spec for cameras. I can show you a link on Red Shark that talks about that. Uh, some crazy stuff going on. So I never would have thought that Red Shark, that put out the spec, and what, what this spec means is, with Microsoft's browser streaming 4K video on a laptop, you have to have a minimum of a 1050 Ti video card to do that. That's where that comes from. So anything above that, if I were looking, I would be looking at like a 1060. There's 11 laptops with that in there. Gil? And, yes, sir. You just said that uh, Netflix specified that 1050 as the minimum? Yes, 1050 uh, Ti, not the yeah. 1050. Well, I've got something considerably below that. Does that mean that Netflix is not going to send me their highest uh, resolution or it's just not going to work or what? Well, according to the spec that they've put out, that they published that we've been talking about now for about a year, you would not be able to stream 4K. Ah, okay. You could stream 1080. All right, well, 1080 is all I'm looking for. Um, 1080 is what most of us do. Yeah. I just uh, today ordered the Elgato and uh, Roku. So the Roku is 4K, but the Elgato is uh, 1080. Ah. So but if you my, want my graphics card is something like a 350. Well, now, see, if you're doing 4K on the Roku, somebody else you may be able to get it but that's the spec and the reason I think that uh, Netflix has done that working with Microsoft is they're trying to restrict how that content comes down so that it uh, stays in a protected mode it's protected content they mm -hmm. don't want people copying it well uh, with the splitters we have 
split uh, that's a different 4K. issue that, yeah. and that's that's a different issue to be able to do a, a, a 4k right now we're talking about HDMI 1.3 allows us to split 1080 to do this with 4k we have to have a different kind of splitter yeah and I that's a whole new animal for example there's two there's two schools of camp two schools of thought on splitters one the splitter that gets the job done but then there's the other camp, which was HD Fury, that says our splitters are superior. But then to do that, you had to have a splitter, which was an HD Fury that had the uh, hacked firmware. Okay. Long story short, as we move forward, HD Fury is now moving their operations back, I think, to China. They're getting rid of the old inventory, and they're getting ready to come out with new inventory. Well, what do you bet that new inventory is going to be able to be able to do? Probably, it's probably going to be able 4K, to do huh? what we want to do. Yeah. So the issue of a 4K splitter is is getting ready to change again. So, well, again, I can't really handle anything more than 1080. I got 1080 splitter, uh, 1080, 1080 screen. 1080 is easy. Yeah. So I was just, you know, I told you I ordered the other stuff, and it would be a real disappointment to me if I had to get a graphics card too. Sounds like I don't. Not for 1080. It's yeah. it's a 4K issue, and they're trying to keep it restricted. See, okay. A lot of times when we're showing stuff up here, we're just trying to teach and show things. So we have to have technology that allows some of that stuff to be dealt with. And, and sometimes even the churches have that issue where they want to show something to their audience on screen. And they're saying, how do we get this up? We've got a Blu-ray player. This is our disc. How do we get this up on screen so the congregation can see it? That's the reason for all this stuff with splitters. I've, I've dealt with it. At Chapelwood, I've dealt with it over at Fairhaven. I've dealt with it with other places, and and we've had it before here. We had, uh, in fact, next week we have a guest speaker. Isn't that right, Lou? Yes. Okay, um, Ralph Gonzalez. When he spoke last time, everything was working. Five minutes before we were supposed to go live, signal cut out. What I think had happened was his laptop, which was an Acer, uh, had an issue with HDCP. The HDCP said, "I'm not sending out." signal on that stream because it's not HDCP protected. Okay, what I needed to do that I didn't have that I have with me now is a splitter that I'll put on there and the splitter does three things. One, it boosts the signal. One, it splits the signal. And number three, it strips the signal. So that the, yeah, tisk, tisk, tisk. So that we can see what's on his laptop to get it up on the screen so you guys can see it, so everyone on the internet can see it. But all these things, have to happen for a reason. It's annoying, and they put it there for a reason. Y'all remember uh, when we had, uh, what were those discs uh, that had SCM on them? This goes back a Go long back time ago. Yeah, the old video tapes, but yeah. the, the, digital, the digital audio tapes. Yeah, CCS and, uh, yeah, and then they, they put that SCM on there yep. to keep you from being able to and it, and it totally destroyed the technology. Terminal horizontal rotor. Well, and, and then we went to uh, uh, Firewire, yeah. and they did the same thing. They, they restricted it so we couldn't send the content, and it totally destroyed if the connectivity. If it plays, you can copy it. If you what? If it plays, basically, you can copy it. That's right. If I can see it. So this issue with 4K, we're going to be visiting more as it comes down the pipeline. But uh, as, as we go forward, there's so much stuff going on, and we're in the midst of it. As long as we can see what we're doing and figure out how to make it work. But I like to go, here's something to watch, and here's something to watch, and here's the people to watch that are the players. So anyway, back to the laptops. Gil? Yes, sir. Just I, random here on your item number 45 on the news screen. No. Yeah, 45 Costco LG. That's a 15-inch laptop with a number pad. It's also $1,500. Yeah, it doesn't show. The, oh, there it is, the price, $1,500. The reason I put this up, because I stumbled into this by accident. I, first of all, didn't know that LG had a laptop when I was looking. So I put this link up because I think it's relevant. 1500 bucks. A 15-inch touchscreen, 16 gigs of memory, and a 512-gig SSD. The, uh, and it's got the 8550, which is the current processor. It's not a 2.8. It's a 1.8. 
But 16 hours of battery life, a USB-C, look at the weight on that rascal, 2.41 pounds. I mean, I'd be afraid of the wind to take that away. That is, that's, that's the lightest I've seen, that's the, that's the smallest I've seen. And that's even lighter than this new uh, six core that MSI is coming out with, which I thought was pretty light, 2.41 pounds. Now, I imagine the video in that is probably whatever the stock is that comes off the processor. There's nothing special there, they're not telling about it, which would be Intel graphics. 72 watt hours, that says 16 hours, so you're probably gonna get about maybe eight hours out of that. It's got fingerprint. Let's see if I can figure out what the video is. I can't get over the weight. I'm looking. Features and versatility. It's got a lit keyboard, which is nice. I guess they all do. 16 gigs of memory, 512, M.2. It doesn't say a thing about the video. There it is, Intel graphics. It's using the stock graphics, so there's nothing special. If there's no dedicated memory for the graphics. That is shared memory. So 16 gigs of memory, part of it's gonna be used for that. But look at the weight. So in, in a nutshell, a laptop is gonna run around $1,250 minimum to get a decent one. Some of this stuff that's going on is going to run anywhere from $1,500 to a couple thousand dollars. But I would still say wait because the best is yet to come. You've got your eye on one that, that you like the specs and it's one that I had never seen. But again, it wasn't one I was looking at because of the processor. Nothing wrong with it. It's just a four core. Both of these are four core processors. As I go forward looking at another laptop, I want something that's, that's at least six cores. Now, if I want to go the full money, I could do something with a desktop processor. Asus has an Asus, uh, what was that, the Asus Republic of Gamers with a Ryzen desktop processor in it. And I would get the full eight cores, 16 threads, but I get a one hour battery life. So, and that's about a $1,500 machine. And on the flip side, if I get one that's got six cores, I've got better video in it, and the video is what I need because that's what I use for rendering the graphics. I want something that I don't bring this machine up here. And I learned something else about this uh, MSI motherboard today. When I shut that puppy down, I have to kill the power to it before I can turn it back on. If I try to turn it back on without killing the power to it, it will not come up. I was about 45 minutes this morning pulling out my hair, and I don't have any hair to pull out. I couldn't get it back up because my routine is always, and the reason I did that was I forgot, oh, there's something I need to put over here for us to look at today. So when I went through that process, I said, wow. Next Ryzen or Threadripper is going to be a different brand of motherboard because I don't like that. that. That is annoying. Which brings up another point. I got a link here on Builder Buy. This goes into a site that we talk about every once in a while, but not all the time. Uh, let me find it. And it talks about what's going on with the new processors. A failure in what? The fact that you can't turn the computer off and then back on. That's routine. You may do that every day. Yes, it's routine. People, a lot of people have complained about the MSI board being slow to boot. All of the Ryzen's are slow to boot because of the process of the enumeration of devices. Uh, and this link I'm going to show you about, that was the first version of the motherboards, and they've done BIOS updates. There's a second version of motherboards that have come out. And if I were to build a machine, I would use that second version motherboard. Well, now there's a third version of motherboards that are going to be coming out in August. And as soon as I find the link, I'm going to share that with you. And there was a, a, a vendor that shared some of this stuff, and it got put online and got shared with a whole lot of people. Here it is, Hexus, talking point number three. I'm going to hold down the control key. A German IT distributor shares AMD and Intel 2018 CPU roadmaps. And this confirms something I had heard a couple of months ago, the reason I was waiting to build a Threadripper, but then everything I was reading said that was not true. This confirms what I originally heard 
And that's why I'm waiting to build a thread ripper. Because on the AMD side, you can read the full article, but we're going to go to the gist of it. AMD Z490 motherboards will emerge in June, likely tied to Computex, Computex, which is in uh, China. The B450 boards are going to add a new chipset to the mainstream from late July. A second generation Threadripper, which will be the TR4, they're calling that Colfax, and an X399 motherboard refresh will launch sometime in August. So I'm not building a Threadripper until that new stuff comes out. Well, if it says it's going to be launched in August, that means it won't be here till September. September, maybe. Yes, Robert. Uh, yeah, I mean David. All right. Uh, earlier, you were mentioning this uh, um, Busonic PX747, and uh, I'm the not sure how that differs from the 727, but lumens. The lumens. One is 22 lumens and 2200 lumens, and the other was uh, 3500 lumens. All right. In AVS forum back in uh, January, they were examining the 727, and it does not use real 4K technology. It uses what's called pixel wiggling, where uh, it very quickly wiggles pixels to make them appear to be for uh, tw twice as many as uh, as are there. So they're fudging. So it's it's a good yeah. idea to wait. Maybe, but. I well, mean, some think, people don't mind the pic pixel wiggling, but uh, it's not the true. It's not thing. a true 4K. Yeah, it's something to know, something to know. But again, this is the first affordable 4K projector I've seen, without going to something like a Sony or Christie Digital, which is about the size of a table. Well, there are you know, there are a bunch of smaller ones out there. Uh, there's some good ones for about fifty-one hundred dollars or forty-nine hundred bucks in that range, but well, they've come down nothing quite a bit. at fifteen hundred. Yeah. I haven't seen one for that. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, so back on this, this is the German IT distributor Blue Chip. They had a webinar for their partners, and some people grabbed some screenshots and they put it up on YouTube. So that's how this article came out. We're not supposed to know all this. And we can go to the site, there's a link, and it talks about what's going to be coming out and what's happening with Intel and AMD. And this says August the 18th, so. Uh, my guess is probably going to be September. And then they're talking about a new Intel Z390. First eight core engineering samples target June of 2018. So that's something to be aware of. So for that reason, that's why I'm waiting to build a machine. But as far as a laptop, the stuff we're hearing about laptops, all that's happening right now is what we heard about at CES, which was in January. It was just, when's it going to happen? It's starting to happen right now. So if we go back over to B&H, and I'm looking at these based on, that's how I found the Thunderbolt 3 link, and that's why I put it up. But that's how I found bestsellers, the $1,800 one, which uh, should have already shipped, and then the $2,100 one. So I'd have to go in and refine that even further. But there's an Asus Republic of Gamers in here that has that processor that's about $1,500. Now there's an MSI with a 17 inch. Again, if I'm looking for a laptop, I like, I like the HP, I like the uh, Asus, as far as which one I put first, depends on the specs. And I'm always curious, when people are looking at a laptop, like I go to uh, Costco, I think most people are probably shopping uh, brand and price over specs. I always say, I want to shop specs first. That's my thing, I want to know what's in it. I'm not concerned about the brand as a, as a first. I want to know the brand, but I want to know what's in there, what the specs are, and then I'll consider the brand, and then I'll consider the price, because there are some two-core processors out there that are going for about the price of a four-core. I'm hoping as time goes on, some of these six-core prices will come down, but when you can get a six-core for the price of a four-core, you're talking $1,500. I would rather have more processing power, but that, that's just me. Did you have a comment, Jim? Oh, I 
the thought I saw. Now, this only shows a handful, but it doesn't show an Asus that I found that had a Republic of Gamers with a uh, six-core processor with a 17-inch screen. The Asus they're showing, oh, here's, the, here's one. Yeah, it does. Let me hold down the control key and we'll bring that one up. There's an example. This is $1,600. It's six cores, 16 gigs of RAM. What I don't like about this, it's got a 256 gig SSD. And what I do not like about it is the, is the drive in there is an SSHD. I don't, I don't get that. Either put a spinning hard drive in there or put an SSD in there. I don't like those combination drives. I think they stink. So those two things to me I'd want to change out and I don't really want to buy a laptop that I got to change out. But I'm good with the six cores. I like the fact that, and it's in stock right now. It's a 17 inch screen. Now, with those things I don't like, I like the video that's in there. That's a GTX 1060 with six gig. I can change those out later, and probably most people will never need that space. In fact, for an example, this machine over here that's got all this goopledy gop on it, this Ryzen machine, I got a one terabyte in here. I'm just going to take a look at it. I've got an M.2 NVMe, one terabyte. And I've, I've got 764 gigs free. So I have used 166 gigs. And I do a lot of stuff, which means someone with 256 is never going to do what I'm doing, especially on a laptop. But that's just me. I want a 512 on a, on a drive. But that gives you a comparison. And I let all the applications do their install the way they want to do, keep it simple. But everything else I put on other drives. So, you know, this machine I could live with. It's not bad for the price, $1,600. But the weight, because it's a 17-inch uh, screen, my, my base clock speed is 2.2. It'll go to 4.1. I've got 16 gigs of RAM. I know this will support 32, but I'm not sure if it'll go to 64. We've got an LCD screen. It has that high refresh rate and that G-Sync. That's some AMD technology. Gil? Yes, sir. I'm amazed. That's the second laptop we've seen that shows a, a boosted clock rate. Has anybody ever uh, boosted the clock on the Laptop, how do you even get to the CMOS to do that? You know, most laptops uh, don't get you to controls. Well, you know what they're trying to do is they, that's, that's how uh, Intel uh, sets up that long battery life, is they restrict that CPU and throttle it down. That yeah, was well, something that I can Dwayne understand talked that. about. And they throttle that down to conserve battery life. But is the uh, maximum boost speed that they have up there, is that a meaningless spec? Just like any color is black? Well, from 2.2 .2 is where it'll be sitting at in idle. It can go to 4.1. Okay, so that's not a... Um, burst, I think. Right. Okay, but the, the point is that's internal. It's, it is going to do that. I thought uh, this was talking about, uh, forgotten the word now, boosting the clock that you would overclock. There you go. There's, there's, on a laptop, there's generally no way to overclock a laptop. That's what I, I was thinking. So why is that number there if you can't overclock it? Well, what that says is if it needs to, it'll go faster. It'll go faster if it needs to. Okay, that is a very different thing to say. So now I understand it. Okay. okay. We don't have the control on a, a laptop that we do on a desktop. We're, you know, there's a lot of, there is no perfect computer, but we have to give up a whole lot less when we're looking at a laptop. What I wanted to check was were the ports. See, there's no mention of a Thunderbolt port on this. And for a new processor, I'm really surprised. That other machine that you're looking at has Thunderbolt. If I'm going to do some Thunderbolt stuff, I'd like Thunderbolt 3. Some of the people are complaining with the Dells that it's got Thunderbolt, but it's Thunderbolt 2. And there's compatibility issues when you go from Thunderbolt 2 to Thunderbolt 3. Thunderbolt 2 works with Thunderbolt 2. Thunderbolt 3 works with Thunderbolt 3. And just because it's USB-C does not mean it's Thunderbolt 3. If it's got the lightning mark like that one had, it's Thunderbolt 3. Jack's laptop, he's got Thunderbolt because it's got the lightning mark on it. And I think you've got Thunderbolt 3, don't you, Jack? I think so. I just 
Where's the mic? Thanks, Robert. Yeah, I think so. I just bought a, uh, my laptop has, since my uh, one desktop cratered has uh, become my, my main desktop computer also. So I bought a, uh, from Amazon, a Thunderbolt by uh, DisplayPort cord cable and it works perfectly and it says on the monitor that I'm getting the the full uh, 4k so how much was the cable 19 something less not than bad. 20 bucks not bad yeah. I've bought cables and stuff to do this Thunderbolt I think I think I paid $65 for one converter and I just that's in, in theory, the same cable is supposed to work on my phone, so I haven't, I haven't tried that yet. Nice. Well, I know when we had the uh, Dell monitor up here, we were looking at some of the issues with uh, connectivity. And, and, you know, again, you don't know if it's going to work until you try it. Absolutely don't know. So looking at this, what I wanted to go to, and, and I'll get down here, I was going to look at the weight. It's interesting, Bluetooth 4.1, and again, a 720 video, 76 watt hours. Four cells, Windows 10 Home, six and a half pounds. So, 10 pounds for the package, six and a half pounds for the laptop. So, what do you think you are? Are you, are you still planning on getting one now, or are you going to wait just a little bit longer? Is, is the wife really. Uh, she's getting aggravated. She's getting aggravated. Oh, wow. So, you're going to be on a laptop in the next three days. I think the one you found is probably a good place to be. I don't think, you know, I don't think you can go wrong with it, and I'm sure it'll serve you well for many years. Everything is constantly changing, and you know what meets the needs of one may be different for another. When I got this first laptop, to me that was bang for the buck for $800. But when I found out later it was neutered, I was a little bit miffed about that. But then once I realized it was going to cost $1,220 to get it built right if I had bought it directly from HP, I said, no, nah, I'll take the $800. But if I want to speed it up, I can only type so fast, and for what I use it for, it's fast enough, it's fine. Now, for things I need to do something faster with, I'm kind of impressed with this Lenovo Flex 5. And I hadn't paid a whole lot of attention to a Lenovo until we had Jim Fallon's Lenovo. This was $1,000. And there were two versions of this. One version uh, had Windows 10 Pro on it, had uh, Office 365 for one year. When they knocked the $300 off and made it $1,000, I still think this one was a better deal for $1,000. Uh, but I didn't have that when this came along. And this also has a pen I can use. It's a touch screen. I don't use the touch screen right now, and I don't use the pen. And it's a flip, so I can use it like a tablet. So to use this as a regular laptop, I like it. If I were to do some digital artist stuff, like with some Corel Draw or something, it'd be great, I think, for something like that. Sometimes to use some graphics to demonstrate some of the stuff we need to do, I could do it on this machine. And those kind of things that I could do creatively, I wouldn't do on that laptop. So they're both laptops. One's a 15-inch, one's a 17-inch. One's a, uh, I prefer 17-inch. But for doing some of this artist stuff, to put it in relation, why should I buy a separate Wacom tablet when I can use this whole display as a tablet? Now, a Wacom tablet is different than this, but I think this will do what I want to do as a digital artist. And I could probably use this with some of the music stuff I do because it's got a uh, NVMe drive in it and I can get extra USB ports. I could probably plug another one of these anchor to get more ports because for doing music, you really got to have five USB ports. The reason for it, you got to have a keyboard, you got to have a Pro interface, and then if you have libraries that require dongles, there are three different dongles. A standard dongle, an iLock, and there's a third one that I can't remember what it is, but uh, the ones in US use one kind of dongle, the ones in Europe use another kind of dongle. So if you have these libraries from all over the world, there you are. And the point of it is that your, your software will follow the dongle. So you need to have access. So this having three US, excuse me, yeah, two USB ports stinks. But if I can replicate it with a couple of these, 
three ports. I can take two and go to six. I'm good with that. But I need to be on power. But then again, you know, it depends on, depends on what you're trying to do. For example, the mixer that we use could be powered, or excuse me, could be controlled off this laptop. The mixer that I use, which is a pro interface at the house, same brand, just less inputs, could be run off of this. And if you're going to do that kind of audio, you want a pro audio interface. You don't want to use what's on the desktop or the laptop. That kind of audio stinks. You've got to use a pro audio interface. So anyway, let me go back over to Builder by uh, Talking points. Talking point number two, I told you about Netflix. This is an article from Red Shark, which I find kind of interesting. Stuff like this to me is an aha moment that I'm sure we'll come back and refer to later. Netflix is now the crowning standard for broadcast quality. In the past, there were certain cameras that, that people looked at when they were shooting video. Now, because of Netflix's standards, a camera that a lot of people have used, Netflix says you can't use that camera if your video is going to be on our, our channel. So even though you may see one type of video being broadcast, they're shooting for a higher quality video. They're getting ready for the future. And so that's where some of that stuff comes from with the video card we heard about for a year ago. We also heard that Netflix is doing a, a better job than anybody else with compression to be able to spin, send that stuff down the pipeline. So if you had a low bandwidth internet connection, you'd be able to see that at a decent quality. Yes, Robert? Decompress. Well, that's uh, the decompress is something that Netflix has to do on the fly. So if you've got a streaming service like Netflix, then they're handling all that. So there's some kind of Netflix resonant software to receive that video then, huh? Right. They've got the process. That's new, isn't it? Uh, we talked about that a couple of years ago, and uh, the reason that came up is because Dwayne was asking what were the requirements to stream video. You've got the requirements that uh, Roku has. You've got the requirements that uh, Amazon has. And Amazon has now increased those for greater bandwidth. But there's a set of specs also for Netflix. And I told Dwayne he wanted to argue with me about the specs. I said, well, this is what Netflix says. So you want to argue with somebody, go argue with them. I'm just saying this yeah. is what they say. So um, it's not the case then that uh, when you're streaming stuff down, once you get in t past your network connector, it's yours. Sounds like you're saying that uh, once you get past the network connector, the resident software of the source is going to run and decompress whatever it is the source sent you, and then you put it, I guess, on the, the bus somewhere from the processor and say, okay, now you can look at it. But it's not just uh, I got video coming off my network. It's uh, if it's you know like you say if it's going to be decompressed by network software, I mean by Netflix software, then you have to have that Netflix software running on your computer, or yep. it won't decompress. And you, I think you just said that there's two other vendors doing the same thing. Well, Am Amazon's got their specs on what you have to do, and with Amazon. Once you have an Amazon account, then you have Amazon Prime, and then once you have Amazon Prime, you have to pair that device to that account. Well, I was just thinking that too, that you say you have to get a Roku channel uh, activated for each one of these uh, uses that you want, for Amazon or Hulu or Netflix, and it sounds like that uh, it's still not over. Once you've got that account set up, go through the Roku, now you've still got to look to uh, it's just interesting that your computer has to know where you went. Uh, it just seems to me that's new. Uh, your computer, you, you know, it's just like using a uh, browser. You just go somewhere, and your computer doesn't know where you've gone. It just, uh, the browser's doing that. But now, essentially, you've got a um, resident player for each streamer. And so instead of a browser, you've got a player, and it runs. They're concerned about content protection. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's just that's a weird concept. Well, that's why I like, even though I have a smart TV, I don't want to stream to the TV. I want to stream to a media player. Mm. And I don't want to stream to a computer because what goes to a computer is a lot lower quality yeah. than what goes to the player. Well, in my ignorance, I tried a year ago to stream from Amazon Prime, I guess, to the computer. It's and I concluded that Amazon Prime stinks. Yes, and so it, I, I 
let that membership lapse and went on. And then I found out from you six months later that uh, those people won't talk to computers. You got to have some other device there, like yep. a Roku, and they'll talk to that one and, and they'll give you a, a good picture. So, uh, And it's a gorgeous picture. The, the thing is, on a computer, you can flip the browser and get out of it. When you're on a media player, whatever kind of ads they have running, you have to watch them. You can't, you can't <laughs> flip out of them. Yeah, well, that would be true because they're controlling both ends of that now. Totally. So it's just, you know, a little ignorance um, can hurt you. Well, well, I mean, like I say, I tried to, I, I ran a test case for streaming video to my computer because in my level of ignorance, that's it, what I wanted to do. And, and was I was just wrong. And it was terrible. Yeah, it was no good. It was not as good as a DVD. It was terrible quality. I agree. So, you know, that was my ignorance. And, and it, uh, I don't know if it hurt me or not, but it, it put me off a year. Maybe it not hurt, but still, you know, you live and learn. When we, uh, we have an Amazon account, I have it paired to a Roku. We had it paired to the Sony TV, but I never paired it to the uh, first Samsung TV. I don't know if I will pair it to this Samsung TV for all the stuff that we've talked about. It never occurred to me to direct Amazon to my TV. I guess I could have done that. Yes. But then, it never occurred to me to do that because I'm sitting here at the computer telling the system what to do. Then you would have been amazed at the quality. Well, I just, you know, my computer is just a monitor, so I don't use any of its software. Uh, but that, uh, you know, more ignorance. Learn something else today. I hope I don't need it. I hope these devices I just bought, you know, take care of me and I can continue to use the TV only as a monitor. Well, I like the, I like the media player because I can intercept it. Yeah. If it's going straight to the TV, I cannot intercept it. Yeah. Well, as I say, that didn't occur to me. So that's just interesting to see. Live and learn. Make, makes you think. All this stuff makes you think. Now, the, uh, the stuff that's going on with the uh, Asus Zen, I've got to link up to an outfit, num uh, talking point number eight. Lily Puting, a 4.1 pound Asus ZenBook Pro 15 with an i9, and NVIDIA graphics is on the way. Based on what I've seen with the i9s on a laptop, if we go looking at an i9 at B&H, those are expensive. But I'm just saying, if you want to see what's going on with the technology, you can click on that link and it'll, it'll, it'll tell you. Now, I've also got a link, talking point number nine, laptop under budget, top 10 best Intel Core i7 processor laptops. I would expect, since that was put up uh, 417, I don't know that they will have the new six cores that are coming out. Because this list of six core processors is growing. I wouldn't say exponentially, but it's growing. So give it some time if you want to do something right now. Again, that laptop you spotted looks good. For me, for my money, I want to, if I'm buying a new laptop, I want to wait for a six core. Even if I don't choose a six core, I want to wait and see what else is coming on the six core. And the reason I say that, the laptops I judge them all by is the Asus Zen. That laptop two years ago, I'm still amazed. I still think it was the best bang for the buck. I still think that's a beautiful laptop. Even though it had a 4K screen, it was not a true 4K for the price for $1250 and for $1225. They made one difference. The first models were $1225. It had an NVMe drive. The second set that came out, that was the one thing that changed. It was not an NVMe drive. Still the same size, still the same ca capacity, still an M.2. So they went to a less performance drive and raised the price 25 bucks. And the reason I knew about it is because I was digging for it and somebody else was digging for it. And they were upset because they were trying to put those into the market without telling everybody about it. And they didn't last long. Less performance, $25 more. So for $12.25, $12.50, then after that went off, you could buy one on uh, Amazon, but it wasn't $1,250. It was about $1,500. And I think y'all also had Windows Pro on yours, didn't you? Or do you have Windows Home? Do you remember, Lou? Yours got Pro. Okay, they all, all had Pro on them. Yes, Robert. You're saying that uh, the M.2 is not NVMe. Does that just mean that it's not using all four channels? Right. Okay, so if you, don't, if you just use two of them, then you, you don't get as much. Well, you've got a stick of chewing gum. Let me, uh, let me see. I think I've got a picture up on this computer that I can show you the quickest. 
uh, on these 970s, if we go to computer number three, you got it. Okay, let me take graphics off air because I need to zoom in on this. So I'm going to zoom in. To me, this is counterintuitive, but that one slot, that one notch, is the faster. Right. If it's got two notches, it's the slower. To me, that's just counterintuitive. You would think with, but anyway, I guess the way to look at it, it's got more pins. Let me back up just a moment. Yes, sir. Uh, a week or so ago, I showed a little something on those uh, devices, uh, NVMEs. Yes. And it didn't go through the notch, but I did show you know, that they, the ones that I was looking at are all specified in the 2,000 to 3,000 megabits per second or megabytes per second, one or the other. And the thing that I didn't say was if you just have an SSD, that 3,000 number is 455. And that's why they're different. Uh, so if you get in that uh, M.2 socket, uh, particularly with NVMe, you can have a 2,000 or 3,000, whatever it is, megabits or megabytes per second data rate. And if you don't do that, you put an SSD, you're going down by about a factor of eight. And I think you, will, you can feel in the real world a difference by a factor of eight. And that's why I've got an SSD and I'm waiting to prices to drop enough that I'll go ahead and, and make the other step. And I'm expecting to be able to tell. Now the 970 is now showing up on Amazon. I didn't expect that this quick. Here's a 970 NVMe. And what I'm going to do is go down and look at the chart. Think of a, a spinning hard drive, 7200 RPM. That's SATA 3. SATA 3 is supposed to be 6 gigabit. If you do an add-in card for SATA 3, it's going to be at the speed of 5 gigabit. That's the burst. So you go from 5 gigabit to an SSD, uh, which would be, uh, let's go Well, down. look at an SSD. Yeah, let's go down here and see if it'll show it. There's a chart they used to show, and they're not showing the chart. Bummer. Let me go back up to the top. Are you on uh, Newegg? There's one of them that Amazon. shows. Okay. There's yeah. one of them that shows the chart they used to, on the. Uh, let me do a search for the 960. Well, New Age will let you see it. Did they show a chart? Well, when you go to specs, you can and you can compare if you want. Well, this chart that they used to have was the easiest to see. There's the OEM drive. Here's a 960. Let's see if this will let us see it. No, it's not going to, but I'll take a look anyway. The 950 may show the chart. Let me go down here and see. Nope, no chart. One of these will have a chart that shows the difference in the speed, and that's what I'm looking for. Let's go look at a 960. Okay, this may work. 960. Yeah, here we are. Here's a chart. Okay, looking at a... Uh, yeah, Those are bytes, 2,000 bytes per second, megabytes per second. Well, first of all, the interface, an NVMe versus a SATA 3.6 gigabit, and the, of course the USB 3.1. We can go from 3,500 megabyte to 3,200 megabyte, down to about 550 to 450. And supposedly some of these SSDs will get up to 650. But this says 550, so okay, we'll go with that. An SSD. So this HP Envy laptop, it's got a 7200 RPM hard drive. So if I wanted to upgrade it to an SSD, I could get 550, 550 megabyte. Now the interface is say to 36 gigabit, but the, but I'm not going to get that kind of speed. I'm getting maybe what 150 megabyte. So I go 150 megabyte for a spinning drive, 550 megabyte for an SSD, or if I've got a machine that'll take an M.2, an M.2 NVMe drive can go from 3200 megabyte to 3500 megabyte, which translates again back to what I said in the beginning. When I'm doing a Windows new computer and I'm creating the account and I'm going through the process of answering those questions, I can go from 45 minutes to 15 minutes. And that's just one thing. 
the applications start up quicker, the computer starts up quicker, uh, installing stuff starts up quicker. Now this Ryzen machine that has a one terabyte NVMe, the graphics that are on that machine, to me, as they're coming off of that M.2 NVMe drive, I'm sitting there watching, twiddling my thumbs, and to me it acts like it's coming off of a spinning hard drive. I would hate to think to install that application on a spinning hard drive because it would take five times as long. My perception is that's taking too long. My perception is that needs to go faster because my perception is everything else happens faster. But there's a lot going on with those graphics when they load. So yeah, I, if graphics are the limit rather than your transfer rate, uh, putting a faster uh, memory device might not help you at all because you got the same graphics. Well, as the application loads, once it loads, then it has to render whatever it's doing. Right. And, and the rendering, that's completely separate. But just calling the application up, that's coming oh, up. Oh, you're off. seeing the launch time. Okay. It's just the launch time coming up, to me, is excruciatingly slow for that application. It just, it's like it's chugging along. That's very strange. Well, there's a lot to that. There's a lot there. But I like to show this chart to kind of put things into perspective when you look at what the interface is, what the form factor is. You look at the, uh, the interface for the, uh, for the computer. You look at the read speeds, the write speeds, and then you look at the type. It's, uh, and we're looking just at Samsung. I still think Samsung is the best bang for the buck. But there are other options. I've used Crucial in a machine. I've used, uh, seem like I used a Western Digital in a machine. But most of the stuff I've done, I've used the Samsung. In fact, when we record uh, the meeting uh, to the SSD recorder, those are on uh, either Samsung or uh, SanDisk. Those are on SanDisk disks. But they're high performance disks. Well, you can almost, you can see some of it there just in the center column is um, a SATA drive. Yeah, SATA 3, 6 gigabits per second, but if you go down one line, it's 550 bytes, megabytes per second. And so that's one SATA channel. You yeah, go four SATA channels, you expect to get 22. And uh, they must change something else. It's not just the SATA because instead of 22, it's 35. Well, and when you say SATA channels, let's be specific, PCI lanes. This uses four PCI lanes. Well, that's the way they say it. Well, they say it's a SATA by four is right. the way they describe it. So that's right. why I'm saying it that way. And when you're looking at a system and it, you're talking about resource allocation and you're looking at a chipset, you want to know how many... PCI lanes does the processor support? How many PCI lanes does the chipset support? And we did a video about that, the uh, AMD versus the Intel. You get more PCI lanes with an AMD than you get the Intel, like that machine Ray built. Ray built Intel, he doesn't have as many PCI lanes, doesn't have as many resources. It's all about resource allocation. And the resource allocation with PCI lanes is kind of like we used to talk many, many moons ago when we were talking about IRQs. That's what I equate that to. Mm. But this resource lets all these wonderful things happen. Whereas used to the IRQs, if things didn't work, you had a mess. But this chart, referring back to this, I think it's important to show this. And because it looks like they're not keeping up with this chart, we may need to uh, make a copy of this chart and put it on Builder Buy because this is relevant information. It's still good to know. If you're looking at building or buying a computer, I just can't advocate enough putting an NVMe drive in a machine. That little stick of chewing gum is where you get all your speed. And right now, the next leap in technology, they say that right there is the bottleneck. And that right there is the next thing we're gonna jump over. What's it gonna be? Who knows? But this is good till 2020. Another realization that I came to recently, I'm not sure how significant it is to everybody else, but. To me, um, the number eight SATA channels seems to be pretty common, like uh, there's some set of chips, uh, certainly an agreement that uh, eight SATA channels is a, a good unit. You mean eight SATA ports? Eight SATA ports, right. Um, but if you look at one of these motherboards that has an M.2 connector, yes. and they say you can, you know, M.2 is SATA by four, 
Well, that's four SATA channels, and yet they still offer eight SATA channels on the board. So they have doubled it somehow. There's this, the new ones are it's, fast. It, well, it, it depends. It depends. To say a blanket statement, for example, when we were looking at building the FX machines, the originally we didn't have M.2. The second version of those boards that came out put M.2 on there. They didn't That's support, the one I have. Yeah, they didn't support NVMe, but they supported M.2. It's an either or. When you put an M.2 in there, you, you turn off those other uh, SATA well, ports. Well, uh, I remember that used to be the case. You think it still is that way? On that board, yes. Ah. But on the newer boards that support the NVMe, because there's more PCI lanes, you can use all that stuff. Well, I don't see any asterisks in the specs anymore saying that this is a SATA by four asterisk. You can lose four motherboard channels if you do this. I'd have to pull the manual and take a look at yeah. it. But, well, but you I, may be right. I'd forgotten about that aspect. But I'd remember seeing that. That may push me back onto that cyber card. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's always resource allocation. You, yeah. You, you've got to have the PCI lanes to allocate. And, it, and, and how this first came up was when ASUS first came out with Thunderbolt. When ASUS first came out with Thunderbolt, you had to have a very specific card that ASUS made. It not only fit in a specific slot, but it had a specific cable that tied back to the motherboard. All it had to be plugged in. But when you plug that card in, it shut down half the resources on the board to give you that one Thunderbolt port. Well, but these days there are motherboards that have two M.2 slots. Because Do you lose all of your SATA channels if you use both of those? Because it's changed. Resource allocation has changed. Okay, so that's another step farther. Okay. Again, because the newer chipsets, more PCI lanes to let us do more stuff. Okay. Well, I sure don't like that uh, gigabyte card that I've got. I guess I've uh, worn your ear out complaining about it. But I, uh, I don't really want to move forward because I have, it'd have to start over. I can't get that 990 uh, chipset supported by any other card. I'd have to go ahead and do the, the uh, writhing, whatever Are you it is. saying an add-in card or the motherboard? Motherboard. Yeah. Remember well, they said that you can't have a uh, front panel disk unit on our motherboard and the, and the guy told me you have to connect your SATA drives directly to the motherboard and I say well no, you don't. that's not possible you know because there's no socket there that will accept a disk you have to use a cable or he said oh well that's what I meant well okay so it's not directly connected it goes through a cable but if you put a king win or one of these things that you've got removable racks uh, in there then um, it quits working and I have verified that that they uh, those do not work. They only work some of the time, and it's something that only works some of the time, even if it's 99%, what is I, worthless. Robert, what I found was I had to change the cables when I was using the racks. Yeah. When I use the racks, there's a very special cable I use to uh, give me better continuity of signal. Mm. And that solved some of the problems I was having. And I found that problem when we were doing that, that uh, throughput test, and we would see a drop in performance when the drive was run through one of those racks. Well, I'd appreciate if you send me an email with a part number for the and source for that cable because yes. I could use some of those. What I have done instead of the cable is to go to the little Sabre board, which has four uh, SATA ports on it. Silverstone makes that cable. I'll have to look it up. Yeah. I think uh, the last time I sent that to someone was probably to uh, Horst. Silverstone. Silverstone makes the okay, cable. Well, I, I can look. It look comes in black and it comes in white, but I'll have to double check on it. Does somebody else have a question over here? Did you have a comment, John? Did you have a comment that you were going to share? No, I just was kind of perceived. Can we get a mic? The uh, question of the perceived speed. Yes. Cloning. When I'm cloning from a uh, my from my M.2 to a regular SSD card. Cloning takes half the time it used to when I had uh, hard drives. And I mean, I mean it just drop from an hour from an hour to a half an hour. Blows your mind, and, doesn't it? Yeah, it's uh, really nice. Yes, Have you it ever uh, booted from your clone? Hmm? Have you ever booted from that clone? Have you ever booted from that booted clone? Booted your computer oh, from uh, the clone? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I was I under the impression that you couldn't do that. That's interesting to find that you can. Well, well it, I mean, it, it says, you know, I selected on the uh, boot menu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. on, gone blank. F12, so you can get your boot selection. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you know that boot too. Selection. Right, I've selected boot from the uh, clone card, mm -hmm. and it says it's doing it. I mean, I have no way of absolutely proving it's doing it well, you can without just taking the out, too. Yeah. disconnecting the uh, the C drive to see if it really is running off of the. Well, there is another way you can do it. Uh, I put a little empty folder on the desktop, mm -hmm. and then I rename the folder. Mm -hmm. And so I say, this is the SSD that was uh, booted on such and such a date or cloned on such and such a date. And you can go to your clone you just made, and it's just a data disk. You can go find the desktop on that data disk, and you can put a folder in there and say, this is the clone to the SSD from that M.2. So then when you boot, you look for that folder on your desktop, and it'll tell you, what you hmm. whatever you put on there. So you can label them. You, know, you can write on a clone. Yeah. You know, that's interesting what you're saying. I would do two things. One, I would change the name of the drive from uh, Windows Explorer, but I would also change the desktop wallpaper. So when it booted, I knew which one I was booting off of for that well, reason. Mine changes every 10 seconds, so that won't help. Well, I, I have mine set. I keep it for one thing. Yeah. But I would do that, and I would change the name of the drive. So anyway, so does anybody have any more questions about today? I hope you got a little bit out of this. I'm sorry we didn't get to use that program. But because Microsoft wants to reboot this computer, uh, I'm, I'm, I'd like to show it next week. I think it's important to know how. Again, if you can set a password and we can remove it, then what's the point? But there's a way to fix it so you don't have to reinstall Windows. So I hope you enjoyed this today. I hope you feel like, yes, uh, Ben. Oh, our speaker next week. Our speaker next week is going to be, uh, yeah, Rolf Gonzalez, retired law enforcement. He talked to us last time about uh, scams. The next time he's going to talk about how to keep your uh, safe house from uh, keep your uh, residence safe from burglars. And there is a hand a uh, giveaway over there, a printer. Oh yes, we have a, a and that's uh, an Epson Artisan 730 printer. John Lum brought. It does uh, two-sided printing, Wi-Fi, USB, and Ethernet. It does CB, CD label printing. Cool. Works, but needs cleaning inside. Oh, it had a leaky. Ooh, ink tank. Two hundred dollars, but a used one is selling on Amazon for two eighty. So if anybody's interested and doesn't mind having to clean the printer, we got a printer over there. So I want to thank everybody online for joining us. Hope you enjoyed this today, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great day, and uh, appreciate thumbs up. <laughs>